Welcome to our training module on gearboxes. During the next few hours, you will be shown the basic principles of operation of gearboxes, how they are constructed, and how to disassemble, repair, and reassemble two basic types now in common use. First, let's look at the principles of operation and show you what gearboxes are used for. Gearboxes are generally used for two basic purposes to increase or to reduce speeds. For instance, here is a turbine that will be used to drive the pump on the right. The only problem is that the turbine operates at too high a speed to be coupled directly to the pump. This means that the driving speed of the turbine must be geared down or reduced to drive the pump. This is accomplished with a gear reducer which is coupled between the turbine and the pump. All that's necessary is to select a reducer that will produce the proper ratio, or speed reduction. Here's another example. An electric motor must be used to drive this centrifugal compressor. However, this particular motor does not turn fast enough to bring the compressor up to its normal operating speed. In this case, we would need to install a gear increaser between the two. The gear increaser would then increase the driving speed of the motor by three times, so it could be used to drive the compressor at 6,000 RPM. Now let's examine another reason for using gearboxes, besides changing speeds. This graphic illustration demonstrates the principle of torque, another reason behind the use of gearboxes. Let's assume that both of the nuts shown are equally tight and that it is your job to loosen them. As you know, it would be much easier to loosen the nut with the yellow long-handled wrench than it would the other example. This is true because of the basic principle of leverage. Here is the principle of leverage that man discovered long ago. Our ancient ancestors found out that it was considerably easier to move a rock with a long lever than another rock the same size with a short lever. This same principle holds true for the two wrenches we showed you a moment ago, and even more importantly, for gears. We'll show you what we mean. Let's assume that the small gear you see in the illustration is coupled to the driver, an electric motor. The small gear, in turn, applies force or leverage against the large gear, turning the gear and the shaft it is mounted on. Here is the same driver, meshing with an even larger gear. Since the yellow gear is considerably larger than the other gear, it is easier to turn because the large gear supplies extra leverage by its size. Now you can see what we mean through this illustration. As you can see, the large gear on the shaft has the same effect as a long-handled wrench on the shaft. It supplies the leverage or torque that is needed. The larger gear will turn at a lower speed, but will transmit much more torque. In this particular gear combination, the high speed and low torque of the small gear becomes low speed and high torque in the large gear. This example shows a reverse of the last situation. As you can see, the driver is now coupled to the shaft with the large gear. This means that the low speed and high torque of the large gear will now become high speed and low torque when transferred to the small gear. Now that you have a basic understanding of torque in gearboxes, let's take a closer look at how the gearboxes reduce or increase speed. The small red gear with ten teeth is the high speed gear and the large yellow gear is the low speed gear. Here's how they work. If the small gear turns through one complete revolution, all of its ten teeth will come in contact with the large gear. This means that ten teeth of the large gear will come in contact with the ten on the small gear. However, ten teeth is only one-third of the total teeth on the large gear. This means that the large gear will only complete one-third of a revolution for each full turn of the small gear. The 
small gear turns three complete revolutions for each full turn of the large gear. In other words, the small gear is turning three times faster than the large gear. Or, the large gear is only turning a third as fast as the small gear. It all depends on your point of view. If the small gear is turning at 1,500 revolutions per minute, then the large gear will only turn a third as fast, or 500 revolutions per minute. This would be a speed reducer, since the driver is on the high-speed shaft. On the other hand, if the driver is coupled to the shaft with the large gear, you will have a speed increaser. In this example, the driver is still turning at 1500 RPM. However, it is now coupled to the large gear. The large gear then turns the small gear three times as fast, at 4500 RPM. Now you can see how gears like these can be used as speed increasers or reducers. Let's apply what we've learned to an actual gearbox. You're looking at a graphic illustration of the top view of a very common gearbox now in use at many plants. This gearbox can be used as either a speed increaser or reducer. The large gear is mounted on the low speed shaft, while the small gear is mounted on the high speed shaft. Let's assume that the small gear has 10 teeth and the large gear has 40 teeth. This means that the large gear will only complete one revolution for each four turns of the small gear. If you coupled the high-speed shaft to a motor that turned at 4,000 RPM, the shaft and gear would also turn at 4,000 RPM. The large gear on the low-speed shaft would only turn at one quarter the speed of the high speed shaft, or 1000 RPM. Therefore, by coupling the motor to the high speed shaft of the gearbox, a speed reducer was created. The 4000 RPM output of the motor was reduced to 1000 RPM through the gearbox. However, if you coupled the same motor to the low speed shaft, as shown here, the large gear would turn the small gear on the high-speed shaft at a speed four times that of the motor. The motor, which operates at 4,000 RPM, is now driving the low-speed shaft at the same speed. However, the combination of gears now increases the speed by four times to 16,000 RPM. In this case, the gearbox serves as a speed increaser. So as you can see, this type of gearbox can be used as a speed increaser or reducer. Here's another very important fact you should know about gears. Always remember that two meshing gears, as shown here, will always turn in opposite directions from each other. If the large gear wheel is turning clockwise, then the small gear will turn counterclockwise. Another very common term applied to the small gear is pinion gear. Let's add another gear, called an intermediate gear, between the pinion gear and the gear wheel. As you can see, the small pinion gear is turning in a clockwise direction. This action makes the intermediate gear turn counterclockwise. The result is that the main gear wheel will turn clockwise in the same direction as the pinion gear. This is called a gear train. You will soon find that there are many combinations of gears that can make up gear trains. Intermediate gears, as shown here, may be used to change the direction of rotation of the gear wheel. As you can see, the red and yellow wheels are turning in opposite directions. They can also be used to change the distance between the drive shaft and the driven shaft. There are also other types of gear trains, like this compound gear train. It is used to change speeds, torque, and direction of rotation, or any combination of the three. 
It would take considerable calculation to find out what the object of this compound gear train is. If you still have difficulty understanding exactly what the gearbox is intended to accomplish, turn the drive shaft by hand and pay close attention to the reaction of the other gears in the train. Another important fact to consider in the selection of gearboxes is the types of gears they use. For instance, these straight tooth gears are known as spur gears mounted on parallel shafts. These are helical gears also mounted on parallel shafts. Note the difference in the teeth. Also mounted on parallel shafts are two gears known as herringbone gears. These gears are sometimes called double helical for obvious reasons. Other types of gearboxes will utilize perpendicular or right angle gears. For instance, these are right angle bevel gears. Note the similarity between these gears and the bevel gears you just saw. The only difference is that these gear teeth are the spiral bevel type. These are called mitre gears, with the name derived from the type of gear teeth. However, there is another very important difference shown here. Both of the gears are the same size, with the same number of teeth. This means that this gear combination will not change speed or torque. All they are meant to do is change the direction of the drive. Here's another very common speed reducer called a worm gear. In this gear arrangement, the driver is nearly always attached to the high-speed shaft with the worm gear on it. The worm is designed to drive the large gear, but not vice versa. This is the only one of the gear combinations you've seen that cannot normally be used as a speed reducer as well as a speed increaser. Another factor that is vital to the smooth operation of all gearboxes is lubrication. Here is a typical right angle gearbox with bevel gears. The gears and shafts are being lubricated by a system called splash lubrication. As you can see, the gear wheel picks oil up from the bottom of the gear housing and splashes it over both gears and into the trough being pointed out. The oil in the trough then runs down around the shaft, lubricating it. This system of lubrication is often used in motor-driven and small turbine-driven gearboxes. Here's another very common lubrication system called forced feed. As you can see, a pump mounted on the low-speed shaft draws oil from the bottom of the housing and sprays it onto the gears. This forced feed system is usually used on larger gearboxes. Let's take one more look at two gears mounted on parallel shafts. Remember that the large gear is called the gear wheel. The gear wheel is mounted on the low speed shaft. The small gear is called the pinion gear. And it's mounted on the high speed shaft. Remember one basic fact about gearboxes and you'll have no trouble in figuring them out. The large gear will always turn slower than the small gear. If you remember this, you'll have no difficulty in understanding the basic principles of gearboxes. Remember also that the driver may be mounted on either the high speed or the low speed shaft on most gearboxes. Check the manufacturer's manual to be sure. If the driver is coupled to the high speed shaft with the pinion gear, the gearbox will become a speed reducer. If the driver is coupled to the low speed shaft with the gear wheel, the gearbox will become a speed increaser. That's a basic introduction to gears and gearboxes. We'll be back to show you a specific 